Sorry, I wasn't muted to start with. Everyone can hear my heavy breathing from racing over from my lecture theatre to my office. Apologies for that. <laughs> my colleague has finally, uh, has very kindly made me a cup of tea. How's that for, for service? Thank you, Alvina. Um, are we waiting, uh, uh, Joanna, are we waiting for anyone else? Or are you? You, are, you can speak now. You are on the live stream. <laughs> We're live streaming. <laughs> You're live. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Enjoy your coffee. Yeah, <laughs> I have my tea. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining uh, this Atlas session today, um, which is exploring uh, a new special interest group on climate change. Joanna Fusari here at uh, the uh, Dalian University in, in Sweden um, has been working hard on this and um, uh, she will be uh, facilitating the session, but I thought I'd say hello and introduce myself and Atlas a little bit. My name's Tara Duncan. I'm based at Dalarna University in Sweden, and I'm the chair of Atlas. Atlas is an association which is turning 30 years old next year uh, and uh, is an association that really promotes the teaching and research of tourism across uh, the whole industry, industry, practitioners, researchers, students, uh, and uh, the events that we're holding this week are in lieu of the annual conference, which should have been held in Prague, um, but 2020 has, has meant that that wasn't possible. And our friends at AMBIS, who are going to host us, have been co-hosting events with us this week, and hopefully will host uh, a conference uh, in person in Prague um, sometime next year, although we will, of course, wait and see what happens and uh, what it looks like. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, Joanna, shall I pass over to you as sort of moderator chair of this session? And I will I will fade into the background. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tara. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here coordinating this uh, this group and being part of this uh, online event. Uh, this is actually, uh, this uh, special interest, uh, this online event connects to the, a, ver a very new, uh, that brand new actually. This is our first uh, meeting. Uh, we want to inaugurate actually the group uh, through this. And we and this group came as a, um, as a need actually from all of you. Uh, it followed up the, uh, uh, the the demand for let's have a, a group a group on climate change and tourism and take some action on that and our share of uh, responsibility uh, we uh, the researchers uh, researching on tourism and climate change uh, so what we are trying to do here today with this special uh, track uh, on the digital conference of Atlas is first of all to spread the word of the special interest group and invite maybe and uh, stimulate you to participate and become members in our special interest uh, group. Uh, for those of you who have not done so and you are interested in now or later uh, in the session, you can always uh, uh, contact right away um, uh, Leondine and she will facilitate you uh, so that you can participate on the second part of the meeting. This first part uh, where we have the live streaming right now, uh, it, uh, actually, we want to uh, inspire all of you, and uh, we will have a, a rather provocative speech from uh, our guest uh, today, Harald Friedl, and that's also to acknowledge his contribution to, to the creation of this group. It, he started uh, a conversation in Atlas uh, uh, member list, uh, and then there was such a great interest that here we are today. Um, uh, so... Um, 
I th before I pass on the stage to Harald, uh, I, I would like to say that if you have any, we will have roughly half an, uh, half an hour presentation, and then we will have about 10-15 uh, minutes for questions. If you have questions, please use the chat function, and uh, I will be reading uh, uh, the questions and uh, facilitating so that uh, Harald uh, will be answering. Uh, so, welcome everyone, and Harald. The, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you very much for this introduction. And thank you for uh, all who is joining us at the moment. So, uh, I have the honor to, uh, to talk a little bit about the question, our responsibility as tourism researchers. And very important, the question, but how? How to take this responsibility? how to save the world by networking. So um, I will guide you a little bit through a, uh, uh, on a journey through, a, as we can say, the ethics of tourism research. Okay, I uh, just come back from my summer holiday crossing Carinthia on a canoe. So just following uh, the river and it was really a very weird summer as we know we had this complete global lockdown with severe consequences and um, quite many people were pretty happy about some aspects of these consequences as the pollution has dramatically dropped down and it was been able to be seen on satellite photographs uh, that for example here uh, in Europe especially in the center um, the uh, pollution in northern Italy uh, dropped extremely. Or another example here in New Delhi, uh, how it looked before the river especially, and then afterwards. So there were really, uh, or here, uh, Los Angeles. I mean, now, or the time uh, in the, directly in the lockdown, you were able to see the mountains, which is not possible during regular times. Okay, so what we all know is there was a, a extremely strong focus on permanent tourism economic growth, of which one of the most promote, um, international promoter uh, is the UNWTO. And well, this graph is from them, of course. Uh, but the other side is, and this we all know about, I was, want just to mention some of the aspects of this extremely gross of this pre-corona lifestyle, um, a severe destruction of uh, coral reefs. And uh, the predictions um, say that uh, they are all gone in about uh, 30 years. Or another aspect is this overfishing as uh, tourism is extremely strong uh, related with uh, fish, fish eating as speciality. And already right now we have uh, overfished the sea for 61%. So, and still continuing these techniques by grabbing all the fish which can be taken. Or uh, arable land, um, in the past 40 years, uh, we have almost um, reduced the arable land for about uh, 50%. So we are facing uh, smaller and smaller place on earth where we can grow food. And uh, another thing is, especially related to climate, climate change is the growth or the intensity and the number of disasters and in consequence, also the value of uh, or the cost, the increasing costs of these disasters, of course, because of uh, more and more infrastructure. So these were just some uh, examples. And uh, the point is that we are living on a limited planet, but we still have a growing ecological footprint, or at least we had before Corona, and it was quite significantly reduced during uh, COVID-19. Okay, so uh, the core question for us as researchers, and which would be, um, important to, to discuss this in such a um, uh, special interest group is how can we change this development? But it's not 
that simple. Uh, in fact, over the last half years, I had so many um, questions from journalists for uh, about interviews, especially about the question, oh, will we be sustainable in the post-corona world? So will tourism be sustainable? And uh, the simplest question or the simplest answer was simply, why? I mean, did you ever observe by yourself or among your, your uh, neighbors or in your, within your family this, that the person has changed uh, from one day to another without fundamentally changed circumstances? So um, the first argument I would like to focus more on this, this question about change. Um, why is it so hard to change? And uh, to explain this in a simple way, we just need to take a look on our brain because behavior is more or less simply the expression or the outcome of brain structure on the one side and the perceived environment on the other side. But how do we get the brain structure as we have it? And this is also the result of formally perceived environment. So the, the socialization process. So we can say that the brain structure as we have it, this is determining our behavior and the structure and the whole um, biology of brain is constructed in a way that we continue with behavior because it's much more economic. I mean, this is very simply expressed the fundamentals of uh, neurobiology. But this is the reason why, I mean, everybody of you who has ever tried to make a diet and after reducing five kilos and two weeks later, <laughs> you had probably seven more, then this is the reason. Yeah? If you don't change environment, so, then you come back to the old behavior. So our brain structure simply said, reflects the world which is surrounding us and which was surrounding us for the last years, the, the whole life. And this means that what we are experiencing now or before Corona was the, uh, the result of 500 years of um, expansion and growth with all these systems integrated and uh, consist, uh, specifically uh, on, on, uh, about tourism. It's, we have 70 years of permanent tourism growth, which means we always had this, this culture of growing tourism, make it more attractive, telling everybody how beautiful it is. So uh, you can conceptualize the tourism industry, something as like a, a drug sailor, a big drug sailor, because we are selling actually paradise on earth while knowing that there doesn't exist paradise on oils. So um, we present solution, uh, tourism as a solution for everything. And we tell the customers that they don't need to worry about, they just enjoy uh, the place where they go as long as they have paid for it. So uh, just to give you a very small uh, experience, yeah, putting it. During my, my uh, trip with the canoe, I was on a, a camping uh, place with an acre level and had a talk with a woman and she said, yeah, uh, sustainable tourism is very important. And, and then we talked about cruise liners. As I mentioned, they are very problematic emissions. And then she said, oh, that's really a pity because it's so nice. It's one of the most nicest things to be on a cruise line. Uh, well, what's the background of it? It's very simple because to, to be on a cruise liner means that you get the whole world presented from your personal balcony, but even with better service than at home. So it's perfectly comfortable if you like it. And, and this is the reason why it sold that one. And on the other side, um, it's a perfect way to have a very high return of investment. So why should this thing be changed after Corona besides the, uh, the hygiene problems? So 
Tourism, traveling, the value of traveling and the high symbolic value of uh, mobility to, to other countries is already deeply embedded in our personality, in our culture, in our mentality. And this we can't change from one day to, uh, sorry, to another. The other side is, and what we have experienced right now uh, during this lockdown is if just we would, or we did put down all these economic activities, the result was and still is enormous, highly problematic consequences for millions of people. So especially day laborers had lost their work. Uh, I have good friends in countries like Pakistan, Uganda and other regions, and they are telling me that people there are really suffering. They are starving. And uh, tourism in the meantime is such a global economy and it's so deeply integrated in the whole economic system that this has these crucial consequences. So what is the very first thing we have to accept? The world is complex. It's not that simple. Or as Bill Clinton said it once, it's the economy, stupid. So we have to face this complex world and we have to develop solutions which are compatible, um, which, which are well applied to this complex complexity. Actually, we have a very strong tendency to ignore complexity. And um, uh, Paul Watzlawick, um, formerly Austrian, but later then in America, in the United States, uh, active psychologist and communicational scientist, had developed this uh, expression of the so-called patent solution, but patent with a, a soft D, because this term is a combination of the traditional patent, so a very great uh, solution that you get your license for it and it's protected, but also integrated the term and. So it's a term about a simple solution with which you think to be able to eradicate a problem completely from the world. And unfortunately, we already have plenty of experiences with these kind of solutions. And one of these kind of solutions was the Nazi German Holocaust. So where the Nazis said, okay, we want to uh, put away all the Jewish. Or another one uh, was the, the prohibition in America where the, the, the politicians said, we want to stop the alcohol problem forever. So this was ignoring simply that when executing such a simple solution, the results are destructive. We know it in the case of the Holocaust, uh, it was a, a complete horrible disaster. And in the case of the prohibition, it was the, the growth of the mafia and the establishment of the mafia in the United States because they took over the business of delivering alcohol. So there are fantastic ideas and there are very often ideas you can really use in order to stimulate sustainable uh, solutions and behaviors. So one of the most famous example is nudging. Nudging means that you give a little push to people that they do the right thing and then they do it with high motivation. So this example you see here uh, was done in Great Britain. So how to avoid these this long lines on the moving uh, chairs and to motivate people to use the chairs. And they have designed these things like a racing line and really uh, people from businesses to show, oh, I'm fitter than you and I'm faster than you. So there's really a much higher rate that people use the stairs. So it's healthy and it solves also the problem um, of the long lines here. But uh, these solutions, this idea can be also used for other negative things. For example, when you go to shops, normally you find the sweets always 
at the end of the shopping line before the chess desk, uh, the money desk, and you, you see them also on the level of your eyes. So immediately your brain says, oh yeah, at the end, probably you take some chocolates with you. This is very nice if you have children, because then you have a really heavy <laughs> problem to solve. Uh, and the same thing is uh, with tourism offers. So for example, um, tour operators or uh, tour agencies, I mean, they show you first the colorful and nice and, and conventional uh, catalogs, uh, while the sustainable and more complex offers are normally somewhere back, uh, back office. So people have to ask for it. People have to say, please, do you have something special? Instead, turn around, yeah, because uh, people still say that you can make more money with non-sustainable things. Okay, so what does this example mean for tourism research ethics and uh, as an input for a um, special interest group about um, tourism, climate change, um, sustainability? We have to accept the complexity of the world and we have to accept that change, especially in such a, a complex system, uh, is a very big interactive process, and it's not just a simple thing. And that means in consequence that in order to develop um, adequate solution, we need to cooperate and we need to learn from all these, trend, these different disciplines. So to some expect, we all have to become a little bit designers, communication experts, internet experts, but at least we have to learn to understand all these approaches. So we have to stop to think just in our very specific perspective because this doesn't represent the whole world. So the other thing is, the, the second problem is when we're talking about developing good ideas and spreading them, well, there are good ideas. For example, we know how to fight poverty. Uh, and one simple thing is that we have to focus on creating jobs for women, because in many countries, when you focus on uh, jobs with income for men, uh, unfortunately, they tend to use the money for the personal leisure activities, drinking alcohol, etc. While women have a very higher rate to use the money for their families. So making education or offering education and uh, creating jobs for women means effectively doing something against uh, poverty and for health. But why is this not that widespread? Well, the answer is simple, because we still have very strong, powerful male networks. And this is another thing which we have to accept when we're talking about politics there are systems of politics, there are elite circles, they are of course maintaining and defending their power and they are surrounding with people who are supporting their own interests in order to maintain their power position. So if we want to change the system, we have to be part of the system. If we want to become advisors of the elites, we have to become part of the elites. Uh, one of the very famous uh, example was Henry Kissinger. He was one of the most influential um, political advisors uh, from the 60s to the 70s. And uh, quite many presidents have been advised by him, uh, even though his perspective was very traditional. But I mean, you have to join power in order to be able to be advisor. The problem on this is, of course, we all, we as a researcher, we are a part of the whole system. We are even taking profiting from it. I mean, we are paid by the system, which is through tax, yeah, paying our, our income. So we are depending on the system because they are buying our inventions, our solutions. And we're even reproducing and promoting exactly this system we are criticizing. This poses some 
crucial challenges and, and problems. Um, but I mean, we just have to keep in mind the other alternative. So to get out of the system, to, to do something complete uh, different, to ignore the system would mean to become the hermit in the desert. And you know, from social media, if you are not active, you don't exist. And it's the same with any kind of system. You have to be part of it. So what are the big challenges for the ethical uh, challenges and scientific consultancy? You have to gain influence on political elites. It means you have to be able to loving, make loving, but without getting compromised. And this is the big challenge. You have to be a whistleblower in order to change the system or to allow change in the system, but with an intensity that you don't get excommunicated. So as soon as you are thrown out, you are the hermit in the desert. And finally, you have to offer solutions which are attractive and compatible to the system and but so that the people can live with it, that they can integrate it into their life, into their daily system, but they still have to be serious. Um, so researchers are finally something like a king's chester. So not too much serious, not too dangerous, but still staying in contact with the powerful. Um, I want to introduce a totally different approach, which uh, is fairly discussed, uh, especially when it comes on the question, how can we support uh, transition? Uh, the, the spiritual father of the idea of civil disobedience was Henry David Thoreau, who lived 150 years ago. And he wrote this outstanding work of uh, on civil disobedience, which was, the, the ground, the, the, the main fundamental philosophy on which the work of Gandhi, Martin Luther King and others were based. Well, what is the main idea of civil disobedience? It means that when something is done by the power elites, you are not following anymore their rules. But to do this, I mean, this has, of course, consequences because this could mean you would undermine uh, your social status. It could bring you to a situation where you are thrown out of the system. Like, for example, uh, the philosopher Socrates, who criticized his system uh, and the political and the educational system with the consequence that he had to drink poison because, well, he has judged as being bad. So he was not able to continue his work, but in his case, he was old anyway. So um, the, the second question when we think about civil disobedience is, what can we reach? What can we change? I mean, if you take a look, for example, of our very famous <clears throat> lady, Greta Thunberg, then we really have to wonder what has he changed? What has she changed? I mean, compared to what uh, this little thing called uh, COVID-19 has changed, um, of course, many people talked about uh, climate change, but did the system change? That's a big question. So, and I think these are very important questions which should be discussed in such a network. So what is such a network for on sustainability, tourism, and climate warming. I think, to my experience, the most important thing is it's a place for mutual learning, learning about what is the world beside or beyond our very personal perspective and our personal scientific um, training. And how can we design a common understanding of the world in common and the tourism world? How can we develop and agree upon common ethical standards 
for possible intervention? And uh, how can we develop common solutions? And, and especially the solution, and here I come already to some possible standards we should be discussed. I mean, these solutions, this must still be compatible with our present, uh, present system, because as we were able to see with the COVID-19, they created enormous negative uh, consequences and poor people, if poor people are losing their perspective, then there are high risk of getting social tensions and uh, further, further even uh, violent tensions such as uh, civil war. These common solutions, they must be creative and innovative enough that finally they initiate and promote change and not only promote the system itself. So they have to support economic health, but in the same time, integrate social justice, empowerment and peace. And uh, this is the big challenge. And finally, regenerating natural resources. I mean, I, I have decided not to talk about the concept of sustainability here, but this is also something, how do we conceptualize sustainability. So the most important condition about sustainable solution is beside all those aspects I've mentioned that you yourself have to identify with it. You have to stand behind it. And not only that, you also have to be able to practice it by yourself because if you can't practice it, who else should? then it's a dead solution. It's not practical. Another thing is that, uh, just bring it over here. Um, yeah, <laughs> one of the not an important thing, especially when we are networking, be mindful about your limits because if you're working hard and I've experienced that over the last months. And actually, it was the reason why I didn't continue to, to, uh, to support these initiatives, because almost two times I've been very, very close to burnout. You have to keep an eye on your personal limits, on your personal health, which is your personal sustainability. Because if you collapse, then you can't do anything for the world anymore. And this would be a pity. So to come to the point, even if this is a, a word which is already very famous, but think about it. Think about the deep meaning of it. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. So working as a fool in order to a race for the perfect solution for the world while you're burning out, then this can't be the right solution. I want to finish with a little story. I'm almost at the end. It is, it is a story uh, about an American researcher who spent some time in a sane monastery in Japan. And at the end of his study time, he went to the master of this monastery and he asked him a question. He asked him, can you tell me how I can save the world? And the master of the monastery said, well, this is very simple. You just have to save yourself. Well, the guy said, well, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, I can understand. But now I have another question. How can I save myself? And the master of the monastery answered, well, it's very simple. You just have to save the world. Find your own answer and your own interpretation for this. Well, thank you very much for your attention. And I wish you all the best for the special interest group. It will be a pleasure to join as far as possible, according to my resources. And for right now, well, I'm glad if there are some questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Harald. That was very, very interesting to, uh, to follow. And by giving, allowing some time to our participants to type uh, on the chat their questions, just let me comment briefly. I, I think that was an excellent introduction to our uh, to our group, uh, actually. And uh, you you brought up so many of the things, like uh, uh, actually, how can we change the world? Uh, and should we be discussing that more in our group? Is that what we want to do? Save the world, or what do we want to do with our research? How can we contribute ourselves? And that will be part of the of the, our discussions uh, later on, or the issue of. Uh, multidisciplinarity that you mentioned uh, in, in, the, in the research. That's also very important and an aspect uh, we ho I hope we will be uh, discussing in the second part uh, and in the coming years, actually, uh, throughout our collaboration in this uh, special interest uh, group. Uh, or uh, how can we uh, uh, actually challenge our own understandings and how can we, we collaborate and find uh, innovative solutions that can be also uh, a part of our discussions, actually. And uh, um, yeah, uh, so far we don't, let me check. I don't see some questions. Come on, I'm sure you were a bit provoked by this speech. For example, I was thinking, uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, how can we do it and how can we be uh, actually question the system but play with it uh, and uh, be uh, use it for our own benefit, uh, still being critical to it, I, I somehow uh, it somehow came to my mind the, 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 all these debates on sustainability actually and this. The, the search for this magic recipe of balance. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a lot of uh, uh, opposition on that's not, there is not such a balance and perhaps that is not realistic. It's rather hard political choices and trade offs. And yeah, I was wondering how is that uh, in your perspective? Is, uh, you discussed some ways uh, already, but is it really feasible to just, uh, 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 use the system uh, in uh, in our own way or in one's own way? Well, <laughs> thank you very much for your very important question. I think it depends on how we see the system. Um, the Western scientific um, history or the history of science um, was very much uh, based on this concept of positivism. So this idea that we can find out how the world really is. Well, the more and more we are getting away from it, I mean, uh, scientific directions such as, well, um, the humanities, uh, these kind of things, they, they already realized since long time that there are very, very different approaches to understand the world and to see the world, that there is no objective um, way to see the world as it is. But also in, in uh, natural science, an approach like the constructivism or similar approaches, especially with the, uh, with the emerge of system theory, there is more and more the learning that we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we see it. And that's why the very first thing is that um, the, the also politicians, but also scientists from different disciplines, they need to develop an agreement upon how they conceptualize system, how they see the world. This is finally a, a question of consensus. I mean, just see, uh, for example, when we talk about uh, climate warming, um, different social groups have totally different concepts of climate warming. And especially if you go to, well, very poor country, I mean, they, they don't even see this aspect because they have so crucial different uh, life perspectives and, and, and problems and challenges. And this is something we have to understand and we have to accept that 
with different lives and different environments, we also have different views, but everybody of us. And the only solution is interaction, communication, without telling the others, this is the right way, but more in listening and learning and yeah, developing. Mm. It's not easy, but uh, I think no. it's the better way. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> uh, any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat. Is well, there any? Tara had, had raised uh, her hand before. Is this still okay. there? I, I was clapping, but I, I do have a question. Ah, please. Uh, so thank you for, for a really interesting presentation. Let me put my let me put my video on as well. Um, I, I, I think you raised some really, really good uh, uh, points and, 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 and very, very important points. And, and, and Ioana, you, you reiterated them. I, I suppose I'm, I'm also thinking a bit practically in how how as a, as a research, uh, as a special interest group, how can we take some of those um, challenges that you've raised and, and do something with them? You know, where do, where do we go next as a group of individuals uh, to try and actually begin to do something? Uh, and, and I suppose that's a bigger question than just this research group, but uh, this as well, yeah. Um, actually, I can answer this on the basis of the experience I've made with the, <clears throat> the so-called um, ACT network, <clears throat> the Action for Climate and Tourism Network um, we have uh, founded about one year ago with people like Susanne Beckham, Paul Peters, and so on. And, uh, well, this started with very intense discussion, and then we wrote papers for this and papers for that. And it was more and more exhausting. And finally, it was me who raised the question, well, what are we looking for here? Because... By paper writing, I mean, so many papers have been written about sustainable tourism and nothing has changed or nothing significantly. And the outcome was then that all the members said, actually the most important thing why I'm churning is to learn from each other, to understand things I haven't understood before, to see different perspective. So, probably to get a little bit away from this running around in, in, a, in a room thinking, this is the whole world. And I think it, it's helpful to, and also it makes it much easier to get rid of this, this demand. <gasps> okay, we have to find the right solution and we have to save the world. I think if we, come to the point just to say, hey, it's cool if, if interesting people come together who knows different things and they're engaged and we, we really learn from each other. This already could produce so much and this is then really satisfying, which is to my, um, according to my experience, the most important engine for a working network. Uh, thanks. I think the, I, I think that, that that's sort of what I was thinking, especially when you started talking. Is is and from my perspective, uh, for thinking of it from an atlas perspective, uh, yes, yes. The special interest groups we like to see things come out of them, but one of the things we really like to see that come out is is the networking opportunities, the opportunities to to meet. Uh, people that perhaps you would not uh, have a chance to meet uh, both virtually and and in person if we ever get there again uh, <laughs> um, and to be able to exchange ideas and and learn from each other and to and to build upon what we're already doing rather than and everyone starting from from the same point and and trying to do the same thing you know, rather than reinventing the wheel let's let's utilize the knowledge of a, of a network like this so that we can all build our own research but also come together and and hopefully have even just a small platform uh, to, to move things forward. Um, and um, I know that uh, Johanna has a, a, has, a, has a comment in the, in, the, um, in the chat here, which I'm sure Johanna will come back to, which I think links into that too. So thank you for that, Harold. That's um, yeah, really useful, really useful experience. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both actually. 
that's the best uh, uh, advertisement for uh, joining our uh, our group actually thank you but very interesting discussions indeed and we have a question from Johanna uh, and actually Liana also um, agrees and has the same question and that's uh, uh, that um, uh, she would like the focus on she liked the focus on finding solution and it is a good point that they need to be at least somewhat compatible with the present system. Uh, but to achieve change and rethink growth, for example, the system needs to create space for people with different views or voices. Uh, 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 Johannes and, uh, 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 and Liliana's question does is, uh, do you think people with power will give any of it up? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, nobody who has only a little bit of power wouldn't, or would, sorry. So, uh, I mean, when, when you're on a position, an academic position, and a newcomer comes and, and says, oh, I have some new knowledge, and, and I want to have your post as professor, you're old anyway, so, I mean, what would be your, your reaction? Um, and that's why, what, what is important is that we have to learn to understand. We have to get away from what do we wish to have. And this must be because our perspective is the right one and we're the good guys and the other ones are the bad guys. No, we have to learn to understand how these systems are working in order to learn how can we get into the system and how can we undermine and change the system. And, and this is the critical thing. I think we have to get away from this, this self-conception of a scientist, a researcher who is standing above the world. Oh, I'm doing only the research and I'm in the ivory tower and I look everything from, from top down, but I don't want to make my hands dirty. People who have power they have dirty hands. So they are willing to make the hands dirty and they're working with the world. And if we want to change things, then we have to agree also and to accept that we have to make our hands dirty. And the challenge is always to find out how far can we go. Um, I would like to take the example of a, a V, um, no, how is it called? Um, a covered agent, yeah? So if you want to, to, to defend or to do something about terrorism or about the mafia or whatever, the best chance is if you can bring people into the system. And this guy, he must to establish in the system in order to get up, in order to get close to the powerful people. This is the only chance. And um, the other one, because the system with all these powers is so deeply integrated in our world, it's the dominant system. The alternative would be staying in the ivory tower, produ producing theories, but without any influence. I mean, this is my perspective. A little thing, probably in, in order to make it a little bit easier. When do people change? And there is a very simple rule. It's a neurobiological rule. Change will be done if the alternative option of behavior is either nicer, makes you happy, or it produces less uh, um, less uh, problems, so it's less um, bad. Uh, like when, when you're smoking and your doctor is telling you, if you continue like that, in half a year you will be dead. And I know people who have been confronted with that and they have stopped smoking from one day to another. When people fall in love, immediately they do totally different things. So what we need to learn is to 
give signals to powerful people which they find attractive. When they have the perspective, okay, with this aspect, I can sustain my power because if I don't do anything that it happens to us like, or to me like, uh, well, the modern Pharaoh in Egypt. <laughs> so when there is a revolt, people are pushed away. If you take a look to Prussian Germany, uh, Bismarck has introduced the very first social uh, laws, uh, social protection laws. This was not because he was such a good guy or to help the people. It was to reduce social pressure. So sometimes good solutions are introduced in order even to sustain a powerful position. And this is the question about the signal. How can we sell a solution? Thank you very much, Harald. Uh, I think we need to stop here, mm -hmm. the, the live streaming, and move on to the next part of our meeting, uh, of our uh, session today, the special track, with the meeting of uh, the members of the special interest group. Uh, thank you all very much for attending here. We have got some very encouraging comments uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, about your speech, Harald, and uh, I would like once more to thank you for taking the, uh, the challenge and the invitation on a short notice, I must say, while he was canoeing during his vacation, but he was very uh, enthusiastic about the task, so here he was here today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and uh, the members, please uh, stay on the, on the Zoom session for, uh, to continue with our group meeting. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, and bye-bye. Uh, OK. I think we can... Uh...